Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Several cases of misconduct by athletes and sports officials have made headlines recently from perpetrating physical abuse to making racist remarks. Now, how are cases of misconduct by those in sport handled here in Malaysia? Is there transparency and due process? Joining me on the show now is journalist Harish Dale. He is the co-founder and um, editor of the news site 2213. Harish, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm just wondering um, if we could begin our conversation just getting your observations about the ways in which sports uh, administrators handle uh, allegations of misconduct or, or abuse by those within the, the sporting industry, be it players or coaches, officials and, and the like. What, what have you observed about the ways these allegations have been handled? Uh, first and foremost, thank you um, for having me on board. Uh, to answer your question, yes, there are internal mechanisms to address sh- such um, complaints, whereby they are addressed either by an independent committee um, or within the association itself that has an independent committee. Uh, comprising of various stakeholders. And uh, these matters are um, uh, addressed in their own way. But I think leading back to your opening line of the transparency bit, I think that is something uh, these committees will have to work on while protecting the interests of the victim. um, There needs to be a... um, The information needs to be released in a timely process so that people out there know that action has been taken and and it's not like uh, it's kept like you know it's like another osa kind of thingy yeah so so yeah. That, that communication bit um i admit there is a massive breakdown in that sense okay so so there is an internal mechanism these independent committees Har- harish do we know how truly independent they are who they're made up of um if there are you know, unspoken conditions, fear of retaliation or fear of coming up, of whistleblowing within the the sporting industry itself. Are they truly independent? Look, that question, we will never, we can debate uh, till cows come home, to be very honest, because everyone will have their interpretation of what independent is about. Uh, Nevertheless, I think going back to the question, are there uh, specific uh, committees or uh, channels to address this? Yes, they are. Um, how effective are there uh, are, are these committees? Now, that, once again, boils down to um, the action taken. And most often than not, we do not hear much about this simply because, uh, I repeat again, there seems to be a communication breakdown. And this somehow, re, you know, it, um, it this, uh, what's the word should I say? The optics then are seen in a different, it, it creates a different kind of optics, yeah? Mm. Uh, people right. today, they demand, they want to know, okay, a committee has been formed, um, what's the action? What has been done? What's taken place? You know, who uh, is part of the committee members? Some some organisations do not reveal the identity of the committee members uh, simply because they want to keep it, um, they want to ensure that it's not out there in the open so that everyone can actually make a decision um, not based on any fear or favour. So it's to protect so-called the 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 committee but there's also the other argument that we need to know who these members are um, so that we will ensure that they are truly um, independent right you know some of the cases of misconduct that we've seen uh, reported you know happening in the sports industry have all come to light because of social media so either someone makes a remark on social media that then goes viral or someone is recorded behaving badly or on social media and that you know, it's, it's the pressure from the public that forces these uh, these cases to come to light. Where do you think that's the breakdown? Because we can't always wait for um, the public to, to pressure for action to be taken. Um, are there ways in which, you know, that uh, is there is there a culture of fear and silence to report uh, cases of misconduct or abuse or bad behavior within the sporting industry. Are these mechanisms failing those within sport? No, I mean, Melissa, I, th- I think it boils down to society's approach to such subjects. Um, it boils down to, you know, the, the, the word, the term safe sport. Um, what 
constitutes or what is the barometer, what, what, what is the um, boundary, uh, what is the definition of safe spot. Uh, some people have this very templated view that safe spot is merely just sexual um, assaults and nothing else. Uh, but what about the creation of safer sporting environments uh, to ensure that the facilities are not, you know, um, run down? And so, so the, the, the context is huge. Now, coming back to what you say about the mechanisms, yes, every association um, at every level, in fact, even schools, for the matter of fact, even us in our offices, we all have um, a channel whereby we go through that channel. Now, um, has that ha have those channels been exhausted? Now, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Is it a situation whereby there is fear? Perhaps, I mean, even us at work, some of us may feel that, oh, we better not speak up for fear of being penalized, you know, for fear. So this is more of a cultural thingy um, that has been normalized all this while because we just tell ourselves, oh, we just suck it in and just accept, but which is not the case, yeah? Um, yeah, and then some people find comfort in um, expressing themselves on social media. Uh, and that's where sometimes we find out that, oh, this happened. And when we investigate at times, uh, there have been cases whereby, oh, it was not brought through the official channel. And i.e., what I mean is not verbally, but verbally and also a report lodged, uh, whether it's through the association, whether it's a police report. So all this actually it has to be taken into account. When when we think about um, fair punishment for you know what is considered what has been considered bad behavior or misconduct by those in sport, when do you think an apology is not good enough, uh, Harish? I mean, I, I'm thinking, uh, what are the measures of just punishment for sports? Do we even have guidelines for that? No. Um no, we do not have guidelines for that because every scenario is different. And we can't just have a, you know, a blanket rule. Um, every situation is different. Every person is different. And we have to judge it based on the episode. Um, mm. and, and to answer your question about an apology, I think uh, the minute you assault somebody, um, you know, even sorry is no cure, as the saying goes, you know. Um, right. So, yeah. What about, I, making, what about making racist remarks? Is an apology enough? We've seen that happening. We've seen that happening far too often. And you know what? Um, it, it's 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 amazing that people are zooming in onto an athlete when politicians get away scot free. Um, doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. So it it's just that athletes are confined to its bodies, and they've got people to um, you know, answer. They are answerable to. But our politicians don't seem to be answerable to anyone. So they get away scot free. So I would like to. To, to, yeah, uh, apology, you know, this, I, I'm sure you're talking about the hockey player. And also the badminton player as well. Oh. You see, the, the, the thing about this is that the fact that they uttered such words, um, it goes to show that that's running in their mind. It goes to show that, that they have systematically grown up thinking that that's how they're supposed to see people in that view. And it's scary, to be very honest. And we are having this conversation and we must realize that there are so many people out there who also share the similar kind of views, the stereotyping. X race is something like this. Y race is something like that. Why? Why are we even talking on the racial lines and why we are not speaking about a person? And this comes back to sports as well. Yeah. Now, I've heard so many times in the past that Oh, why is the football team only comprised of one particular race or the badminton team only comprised of one particular race? Now, we take a step back and we go like, if we are all Malaysians, shouldn't the best represent the country regardless of their race? And if so happen, all of them come from one race, is that their fault? So we have to stop talking about race, 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 or religion, religion, and start looking beyond that. And it starts with sports. Okay. Sadly, can, can sadly, I... sadly, the problem is that we all talk about it, but at the end of the day, in the real, on the ground, no one speaks like that. It still boils I... down to to race and religion. And I, I take your point about you know politicians getting away with making such comments that they don't get suspended for making such comments. Uh, in fact, they are, they are celebrated by by certain quarters. 
particularly when they are in um, day one right yet. Can I ask you, Harish, then what, what is the role of the ministry? What are the role of policymakers, of sports administrators, if there is a need to address, address it? We've heard comments come up from KBS that they want to, that sport is no place for race or religion or even politics. Um, so what are the steps that can be done to ensure that, you know, um, we address misconduct like racist remarks at the root cause? Actually, Melissa, to be honest, this is not the Youth and Sports Ministry's um, responsibility alone. Yeah, um, It falls down back to us, each and every one of us, how we speak um, at home, how we raise our children, um, how we refer to our neighbours. Do we call them by their names or do we call them refer to them by their races? You know, So it starts from us. Secondly, it starts with the educational system. Everyone, if you call yourself, we have a national school, it should be reflective of the national, the, 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 the population. Yeah. So it starts with us at home, it starts with at school. And if we get that too right, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So now you know where the flaw is. Mm, right. Harish, thank you for giving us some things to think about. Appreciate your time. Harish Deal of 2213 there. We're going to take a very quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. Let's continue our conversation about um, ensuring a safe sporting environment that is not only free from all forms of harassment and abuse, but also from intolerance and bigotry. Safe Sport is an initiative by the International Olympic Committee. It's championed here in Malaysia by former national gymnast uh, Sarina Sundara Raja. She is the founding president of Safe Sport Malaysia. Sarina, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm wondering whether you can um, begin by maybe telling us a little bit about Safe Sport, um, about the Safe Sport initiative. And what is meant by a, a safe sporting environment? Well, uh, thank you, Melissa, for having me on your show. So Safe Sport is about um, cultivating and promoting a safe uh, sporting environment for every participant. And uh, it could be the athletes, the coaches, the administrators, and uh, even the parents and volunteers who are uh, you know, involved in sports setting. Okay. All right. So, so it's not just about the athletes. It's about the entire ecosystem. It's not just about uh, sexual harassment or, or physical abuse, but more than that. So, um, it's really about having a supportive and inclusive environment for 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 everyone in sport. Um, I'm wondering about the the this initiative. So, safe sport is not just um, not just a code of conduct. Um, as, as uh, what the Youth and Sports Ministry has said, they have decided to go ahead with a code of conduct uh, using the Safe Sport template instead of um, going ahead with a piece of legislation. I think they've, they've said that actually it's easier to, uh, speedier, faster to implement a code of conduct as opposed to taking um, a piece of legislation through uh, Dewan Rakyat. And there are also laws that are already in place to promote the safety of those in sport. How would you respond to the ministry's move, Serena? Um, there's nothing more demoralizing than to move forward this way, Melissa. I mean, the bar is set low with recommendations um, aimed at simplicity and quickness. And this is why Melissa lacks progress and struggles to tackle abuse in Malaysia. A safe spot is not headed in the right direction, despite claims that the um, Ministry of Youth and Sports is focused on athlete safety and well-being. And this is why, because the need for a safe spot code was called for partly due to the survey evidence early last year, highlighting the prevalence of harm experienced by athletes, including physical, psychological, and sexual abuse and neglect. And previously, um, former Youth and Sports Ministry Secretary General, uh, Datuk Jana Santarin, he said this, um, that the findings reveal a disturbing abuse level. However, this report will not be available to its stakeholders and the public. So in general, it is the duty of the government of Malaysia 
to ensure athlete safety well-being who are engaged in any form of sports in Malaysia. So therefore, the safe sport code is welcome as an interim measure. However, with so many cases are being reported and highlighted in the media, the Ministry of Youth and Sports cannot ignore the importance of the Safe Sport Act to provide safety, prevention, protection, and new remedies to athlete victims. And accordingly, given the official nature um, of the legislative process in Malaysia, a Safe Sport Act is possible with an efficient drafting committee to bring it before Parliament. Moreover, from available records, the Malaysian Parliament is efficient in getting legislative reforms and matters of national importance. And um, okay, all right. So sorry to interrupt you. I just I just want to better understand. So this it's so it's not a no for the for the legislation to promote safe sport, right? It's right now that they've decided to go ahead with a code of conduct. So we contacted the ministry uh, for an interview or at least a written comment. They they said that you know once the code is released, they will provide a spokesperson. So it's not like there is a hard no for the legislation. It's just let's do the code first. Do you not see this as a good compromise that rather than just wait, uh, not having anything at all, at least we have a code? I think there might be... Um um, a lack of you know, miscommunication here because from what was informed during our last stakeholder meeting um, that um, the Ministry of Youth and Sports is not um, going ahead with the act and uh, even this was also communicated in the media so um, but the ministry is moving forward with the code um, and not even with the independent center because they think that this is sufficient enough to address abuse in Malaysia so um, I, I'm not sure oh, why. Sorry. Okay. Why? Why is the 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 sports the Safe Sport Act? Why is having a piece of legislation um, important? Why is it more important than having a code? Because currently the penal code. Um, provides general and limited remedies. And at the same time, the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, with, which is yet to come into force, applies only to unwanted conduct of a sexual nature. And similarly, the Employment Act provides remedies against sexual harassment only and does not address other forms of abuse in sports. So therefore, a Safe Sport Act is necessary because it is a sport-centric legislation addressing all forms of abuse in sports and including foreseeable uh, injuries caused by sport-related incidents while providing new remedies not covered under these existing laws in Malaysia. Well, how does it work, the act with the code with the safe sports? Because there are three parts to safe sport, the safe sport act, the safe sport code, and the safe sport uh, centre. How, how do the three work together? Can one work without the other? So sports abuse is a multifaceted and deep-rooted problem, and this requires action on many fronts. So the Safe Sport Code is necessary, but the Safe Sport Act and a Safe Sport Centre must accompany it. So in a nutshell, the Safe Sport Act is legal oversight, the Safe Sport Code is administrative oversight, Finally, the Safe Sport Centre is independent oversight. So we must implement all three to drive the required systemic change in sports. So the Safe Sport Act is vital because it will also give us the authority and scope to address abuse and misconduct in sports beyond the national sports governing level. And in addition, this extension of jurisdiction can help to impose an increased standard of care at the grassroots and the community levels. And this also um, you know, expands uh, mandatory reporting of suspected abuse, including prevention training, and provide whistleblower protection to prevent retaliation. And the Safe Sport right. Center, what it does is it protects athlete safety with the authority um, from the act to respond, investigate, and resolve all abuse-related allegations. And it adheres to the um, policies in the Safe Sport Code, which ensures the law enforcement is immediately engaged and complex um, abuse matters are handled with, with sensitivity by experts with the right experience and skills. So it's very important that um, when it comes to safeguarding in sports, that uh, the approach that we must use is athlete-centered and uh, trauma-informed. Can, can I ask you about the use of the code and the center together? Um, currently, 
there is a there are, there's um an internal mechanism to address allegations of misconduct or abuse um in sport what how would safe sport help address it differently the types of abuse and, and misconduct that we have been seeing uh highlighted in recent headlines where are the gaps from the current system that the safe sport center code and one day maybe the act might help address um so think for example the uh, recent volleyball case so responses to the slapping incident um, at the volleyball mm. tournament only highlighted the current weaknesses of the sports system in its ability to self-regulating furthermore the lack of knowledge and expertise um, about what safeguarding prevention and intervention strategies and compass may result in actual or more potential harm to the athlete's safety and well-being. So therefore, further efforts uh, will be needed to overcome the shortcomings and hold these people um, to their social responsibilities. And essential to this task will be the development of a national independent and impartial reporting and adjudication uh, mechanism to oversee the implementation of the SaySpot code. So um, according to studies, most abuse and misconduct cases in sports, it happens during training and uh, in conspicuous uh, locations. So therefore, the ability to substantiate um, for victims to establish criminal conduct threshold becomes higher. And their fear of victim shaming, which may also jeopardize their sports careers. So in most cases we have seen lately, um, these cases are directed back to sports organizations to handle internally with maximum um, administrative action. So accordingly, the lack of independent investigation creates a conflict of interest, resulting in these reports being addressed um, unfairly or uh, inadequately. In addition, the system also fails to consider the role of the bystander by identifying adults in positions of authority over young people as legally accountable for reporting abuse and misconduct. Because from the video um, of the volleyball incident, we saw there were another adult um, in the frame. And um, so this is what we talk about, you know, the bystander and enabler culture. It's to break the cycle of abuse. So with the Safe Sport Act, what it does, it also provides uh, mandatory reporting. So as soon as someone who witness um, an abuse taken, uh, taking place, it is the legal accountability now to um, report the case to the relevant law um, uh, authorities within 24 hours. So this helps to break the cycle of abuse. Okay, so if we just have a code then, Serena, code of, of conduct for safe sport, it, would that be issues of compliance of enforcing the code oh, would the code even be enforceable so we need to understand that the code sits below an act so the code is inadequate in terms of enforcement okay. towards safe spot because it is procedural in uh, nature and it refers to existing laws that are inadequate to address athletes abuse however it is essential to remember that um that while the code sits below an act um, it is an interim measure but a breach of guidance or codes is not necessarily an offence and needs to be directly linked to the primary act offence. And um, they do not usually carry the force of legislations uh, and are often rules are crafted in response to actual or potential dangers um, observed in the particular field of work. So, but a safe oh, okay. act... So, sorry, sorry, just a quick question to, to to clarify. Who would be so? Is it just if you are signatory to the code? Uh, would the code only apply to those who sign? So, sports organizations, uh, clubs, all of that who choose to sign to a code that would only apply to them. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, I think um, what the Ministry of Youth and Sports is planning to do is um, to make it. Um, um, enforceable through um, signing out to the code however um, um, so that then only these organizations will be eligible for funding uh, and support from the ministry however um, this doesn't apply to the grassroots or community levels because um, we don't receive any uh, form of uh, support or resources from the ministry and mm -hmm. um, yeah. So okay. Um, last last minute that we have with you. How do we then get the buy-in of um, those at the grassroots level? 
if it's not you know if it's if it's not enforceable there's no punca kuasa under a law and um, you're not receiving funding from uh, the ministry how do we get the buy in from the the bottom up from the grassroots level so the grassroots and the community levels um, they play an, a very important role because um, these are where most of the young children and uh, you know participate in sports and uh, for children to take part in sports is usually the parents' uh, decision. So parents uh, play a very important role um, in you know, ensuring that um, sports is safe for um, their child. And uh, I mean, I, I run a gymnastics club and my gymnasts are as young as three years old. So we are looking at you know, a wide range of um, children um, as young as three and up to you know, um, uh, elite levels at uh, um, older age. And um, so it's to get everyone to come together and um, to support the safe sport movement and to bring more awareness to the grassroots level and uh, to increase the education as well. Serena, thank you so much for speaking with me. That was Serena Sundararaja, for, uh, founding president of Safe Sport Malaysia. That wraps up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.